Hi, everybody. Good evening. Welcome to Evoke Therapy Program's broadcast. I'm Dr. Brad Reedy. Today is Thursday, January 11, 2024. Tonight's broadcast is titled Goals and Resolutions. I probably should have called it the Anti-Goals and Resolutions broadcast because, like I said the other night when I introduced this topic, I, I have a different sort of idea about goals and resolutions. I'm going to at least look at it from a different vantage point this evening. So before I get into that, I want to pay the bills and, and give you the advertisement, the couples workshop that I uh, and my wife will be hosting in February, February 7th through 11th is a multi couples workshop, similar to our finding you it's looking to the past and, and understanding how those, those past ideas, conditioning beliefs, patterns are affecting our present day, whether it be our, our parenting relationship, our co-parenting relationship or our intimate couples relationship. So, the benefit of the multi-couples, in fact, when we started our intensive program many years ago, I thought that the multi-couples workshop was going to be one of the staples. But when we opened up our first one, we got very few couples that were willing to come and do their work with another couple, a, a couple that they don't know. And I can understand that. It feels very intimate. It feels like you're going to be sharing very personal dynamics. But what I will tell you, similar to the Finding You, is that you get so much out of watching other people do their work and watching other couples do their work. So I love doing this. We started it last year again. We had a great experience. We're gonna be doing it again. We have a spot left. I believe there's still a spot left. So check that out by contacting intenses at evoketherapy.com. If you want to do your work with your partner, this is not for high conflict couples, but for couples who want to understand and get some insight into where their partner is coming from. I believe that understanding will create greater intimacy and, and cohesion and patience and non-judgment between couples or co-parenting parents. So looking forward to that. February 7th through 11th, contact intensives at evoketherapy.com. So like I said, with tonight's topic, goals and re resolutions, I'm going to be talking about it from a different vantage point. If you're looking for a traditional speech or, or talk on goal setting, this is probably not for you. And I wrote this, if traditional goal setting and manifesting works for you, wonderful. But if you need a new take on goals and resolutions, this broadcast may be for you. For some, goal setting creates a high stakes atmosphere. The thought is, if I create clear goals, I will be accountable to them. I will create a simple pass fail scenario. And this kind of raising in intensity and accountability will be a perspective, a situation that will motivate me. But here's where that gets into problems for sensitive people. This simple and intense high stakes environment is not the cure, but rather it's the disease. I, I'm, I, I'm shocked the more I learn about psychology and therapy, the older I get, the more I see that, that what people think is the cure to our problems is actually the cause of our problems. It's not just off by a small percentage. It's actually the exact opposite. I was talking to a young adult recently where he was sharing with me this idea of goals for the new year and what he was going to work on. And as he said this, he's like, you know, I, I feel like I have to do it this time. And if I don't do it this time, I, I might be a failure. And I, I said to him, that feels like a lot of pressure. And he said, I, I'm hoping that it will motivate me. And I said, it can, but it also is a slippery slope. When we are overwhelmed with the ambiguity of life, and I'll talk about that a bit tonight. When we're overwhelmed with the ambiguity and uncertainty of life, we can... We might reduce life into simple terms, simpler terms like pass and fail, like good and bad, like either or, or us and them. And that kind of thinking puts a kind of pressure on the nervous system and we don't perform optimally. And so for me, I knew it in my bones for my whole life. Goals never really worked for me. I, I couldn't really embrace them. And there are, of course, many situations and circumstances where one is asked to set goals and one is told that you're not gonna accomplish anything without these kind of goals. If that's the case, then why in 12-step culture and in 12-step programming is the most common, the most common saying or slogan that they have one day at a time? I would argue that's the most common slogan used in the 12-step culture community, one day at a time. Sometimes you hear the slogan, do the next right thing, or even easy does it. There's a reduction of intensity of high stakes. 
And that's really important. I talk about this a lot in therapy. I try to teach therapists this because we just can't get out of our programming. What, what I'm talking about is that safety, the feeling of having a, a regulated nervous system is not in some way the, the precursor to therapy, the precondition for what will then happen in therapy. In many ways, safety is the treatment. If it's similar to the idea that I teach a lot where resistance is not something that you get past in order to do the important and substantial work in therapy, resistance is the treatment issue. If it weren't so, we would just be teachers as therapists, right? We would just walk into a room and we would just teach people things, but it's the resistance. It's the resistance that's rooted in shame and in fear and guilt that gets in the way. And I think my own experience, and that's why I said it comes from a different vantage point, my own experience in this work is that the pressure of specific goals of, of you know, I, I, one time I was sitting in a, in a workshop, a professional workshop, and somebody said, what would your five year from now self tell you if they could? What do you hope your five year from, from self would tell you? Or people might ask you, where do you want to be in five years? And, and I understand there, there's some idea that, that could, could, if we follow it, could help us build the, the, the foundation for that goal, for that life that we want. But the way I responded to it in this workshop was, how can I possibly know what the five-year version of me would say to me? If I knew that, I would be that five-year version. I would be that person down the line. One of the things I've learned as much as anything from the work that I've done, and when I say the work that I've done, I mean the, the, the therapy work that I've done in, in dealing with my painful, difficult, and at times dark journey. One of the things I've learned is that I'm always evolving. The person I am today is not the same person I was five years ago. The person I am today, January 11th, 2024, is not the same person I was January 11th, 2023. And for me, I, I espouse that idea that if you're the same person today that you are in five or 10 years, you've wasted five or 10 years. If you're the same person today that you were five or 10 years ago, you might have wasted five or 10 years. I think we have to more than, than I think authenticity, I think mental health, is much more about spontaneity and, and, and kind of that authenticity in the moment than it is about the, this kind of formulaic planning. The formulaic planning gives us this idea of control. But, but here's another thing that happens in this spiritual work. Oftentimes, in fact, uh, uh, the, the foundation of, of my work, of my teaching, is rooted in Joseph Campbell's Hero's Journey. And in the hero's journey, this is a, a template, an algorithm that he observed after studying myths through all cultures and all time, that this one pattern that he saw in all the stories. In other words, he said, all the myths are really just telling one story. And one aspect of the hero's journey is the thing that you set out for in the beginning isn't the thing that you eventually arrive with or arrive at. You might be going out to search for the grail, the holy grail, but what happens to you on the journey is the medicine, is the, the gold, is the treasure in this process. And so it's hard for me to square that idea of this spiritual, spiritual constantly evolving journey with the idea of, of clear goal setting. It just doesn't work for me. It doesn't work for me to set goals. I don't do it. Life for me is a spiritual journey, I wrote. Mental health and mental illness are of, of the spiritual realm. As Carl Jung observed, I have frequently seen that people have become neurotic when they content themselves with inadequate or wrong answers to the questions of life. Right? We, we accept the wrong answers for, for life's most important questions. Joseph Campbell said, and again, this is the spirit of the hero's journey. He said, we must be willing to let go of the life we have planned. We plan in order to have the life that is waiting for us. The skin that does not the, the snake that does not shed its skin will die. My, when I wrote my second book, The, the Audacity of You, and I ended it with the three keys to, to, to enlightenment, basically what I saw as kind of the core spiritual truths of what it means to be on the path toward enlightenment, 
the the third one was learn to die over and over again learn to let go of old contexts old relationships old ideas we're constantly evolving in this process and that to me is life in fact i love this quote i recently saw where it said the things that that are plastic and permanent are not alive the things that last forever are farther away from life the things that die and, and are reborn again over and over again those are the things of which life is made of and again squaring it with this idea this is a, a an image if you're watching it's in my book the journey of the rogue parent but it's also an image originally that i found sitting on my therapist's wall behind her head i would look at it when i when i came into therapy for years i would observe it and, and contemplate it maybe while i was waiting for the session to start or while I was considering a feeling or a thought that I was having. It took me a few years to recognize that the title of it, because the way that it was drawn, the title of it is Words of Higher Enlightenment. That's the title of this little image. And I learned later that it was something that my therapist actually made herself, something that she drew herself. So this is what she wrote and had hanging on her wall, this image called Words of Higher Enlightenment. It's just a list of words. I'm going to read them to you. I'm not going to read them all to you, but I'm going to read several of them to you. Here's what they are. Drop out, fail, quit, lose, relax, give in, flunk, let go, empty, surrender, wait, give over, mellow out, slow down, don't, forget, submit, fade away, relinquish, withdraw, flop, give up, chill, yield, back out, forego, resign, and the list goes on. Because enlightened, enlightenment is about facing the things that we were taught to be afraid of. And this is so important for mom and dad, parents listening. I believe that the child's mental health issue is often a signal, a messenger that we must listen to. And the message is that there's some undone work, something that we need to face and deal with, something that we've carried from our own background, from our own childhood, from, from the culture that we grew up in, from the, the house that we grew up in. There's something there that the child and the child's symptoms are asking us to look at, to deconstruct, to, to, to unravel, to reconsider, and to reevaluate. So, so much of mental health is about this kind of not getting it right, not knowing, not being specific, being able to embrace ambiguity. I wrote this just today. I wrote this completely separate of thinking about this particular broadcast tonight, but it fits so perfectly, I wanted to share it. I wrote, our mental health can be largely understood as our ability to handle ambiguity, uncertainty, and paradox. Let me read that again to you. Our mental health can largely be understood as our ability to handle ambiguity, uncertainty, and paradox. And I went on to write, if the ambiguity and the mystery, for that matter, of life overwhelms us, we may be tempted to reduce life to more manageable, simplistic polarities. Black and white, us and them, right and wrong, either or. We eliminate the gray. This reduction reduces anxiety, but brings with it a host of symptoms. We may look for generic solutions, step-by-step -step instructions, and will ultimately outsource the responsibility of our own individuation onto others. The reason that my broadcasts are fairly organic that I have some, of course, slides and some outlines, but I do a lot of ad-libbing is because I'm, I'm trying to communicate a way of being, a, a, a Tao, right? The way that life works. I, I love Star Wars and the mythology message that it offers us. It's the force, right? It travels through us. It's the way the world works, really. It's the way that the I love Joseph Campbell's book on the inner reaches of outer space, where he compares from, from every level of, of, of observation from the, the universe down to the, the individual cell and how they are replications, patterns of each other. There are certain ways, certain flows in the way that life works. And mental health often is trying to control that flow, trying to steer it, trying to manage it, trying to, again, deal with our... our what can be a sense of powerlessness by having power, by having dominion over life. And in a very simple way, life can be measured, our mental health in life can be measured by how much we surrender. And that doesn't mean that you become passive and do nothing. That's the 
biggest mistake when people hear the word surrender that this superficial idea that surrender means that you're just a passive bump on a rock bump on a log potato on a couch doing nothing it is that you're not fighting against what is and that you realize that if you're driving down the street and you get a flat tire you have to deal with that if somebody you love love has an addiction a, the disease of addiction you have to deal with that if you yourself are neurodiverse, if you have attention deficit disorder, you have to deal with that. You have to figure out how to make use of that. But what happens for so many people is they try to control it. They try to change it. The, the, this Western dualistic idea of I can control nature. I can control my child. I can control my spouse. I can control the way that I feel. Instead saying, again, what is life trying to teach me? How can I listen in better? How can I surrender? And the great paradox of surrender that's, that's illustrated in the classic moment in the first Star Wars when Obi-Wan Kenobi seems to mesmerize the two uh, stormtroopers and say, these are not the droids you're looking for. And, and then the stormtroopers repeat that. These are not the droids we're looking for. That illustration is to show what it feels like when you surrender. It feels like you're in control of the universe because you're going with it. I remember I took a course, my wife and I took a course on hypno hypnotherapy just for our continuing education credits. Uh, it wasn't that I was going to use it, but I thought it'd be interesting and you need to take so many credits. And so we signed up for this course in a hotel downtown Salt Lake. And I remember the basic instruction that the, the, the teacher was explaining. If you use, for example, the old, watch as an example as, as a point of focus and you're trying to put somebody into a, a trance state what you do is you start to predict or, or start to to suggest what has already just happened if you see see the person blinking slowly you say out loud your eyes might be getting heavier if you notice that their respirations are slowing down your breathing might be slowing Slow your breathing, right? And what you're saying is you're, you're going with what is happening. You're, you're finding this, this, this meld between what you're seeing is happening and going along with it. I was just describing to somebody the other day, they were struggling over their child's anxiety and self-harm. And they've tried so much. They've done their own work. They've done their own, their own intensive. They, they're regular members of the Al-Anon group community they've read they've just done amazing work and as my client was describing their daughter's anxiety and self-harm and all of the triggers that she felt what i said to her was the one thing that we're not talking about with your daughter's self-harm is we're not talking about the benefits i don't hear you talking about how it serves her i remember my daughter one time shared with me that she was working with a client who had an eating disorder and of course, this, this individual knew every, essentially every idea that would support why the eating disorder is harmful. And my daughter, being the gifted therapist she is, said to this woman, maybe we spend some time thanking your eating disorder and talking about how it served you well. Do you see the shift? It's not trying to control it. It's not trying to fight. It's not trying to dam up the river of life and, and, and redirect the flow. Of, of what life is and what's happening, but it's getting in line with it, understanding. It's getting into the flow, the flow state. From the book, What Matters Most, Living a More Considered Life. Learning to live with ambiguities, learning to live with how life really is, full of complexities and strange surprises. I love what, what, James Hollis says, he says, if the ambitions of youth, many of which we were able to achieve, truly serve the soul, then we would see a lot more happy people. This goes back to that idea of goal setting, right? We think that the, we think that the thing that will make us happy is the golden chalice. We think that when we finally score that job, when we finally graduate from school, when we finally get married, when we finally move to the big house, whatever it is, 
we finally get that number on the scale that we're looking for, then we will be happy. That is the way that our brain thinks. <clears throat> That's what the culture teaches us. But what we realize is that happiness is a precondition for, for getting the things that we want. Happiness is the goal. Learning how to be at peace, learning how to be, uh, learning to develop a sense of serenity, a sense of meaning. And then all of our goals are realized. Uh, D.W. Winnicott, a very wonderful, wonderful writer, therapist, explained that it's the false self that brings the real self into therapy. Even. In other words, what he said was, the reason that people come to therapy isn't even, doesn't even make sense in terms of what therapy is. Right? They come because of their symptoms. They come because their marriage is falling apart, because because they're 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 struggling with 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 drugs or or sex addiction or with anxiety, whatever it is, depression. They come with those things, and they come asking, of course, to get rid of those symptoms, whatever those are. People send children to my wilderness program for this very reason: help my child. I love my child. They're in obvious pain. Can you fix the symptoms that seems to be causing the pain? And of course, over time, as trust is built up, we explain and reframe the whole, the whole paradigm to say, let's not focus on the symptoms. Let's understand what the symptoms are telling us that the child themselves can't tell us or are, are unable to tell us. Let's listen to these messengers. Let's listen to the invitation that they're, they're making. What, what task is unaddressed in our life? What responsibility to, to our own soul are we avoiding? Carl Jung said that people will do almost anything to avoid their own soul. So th this symptom focused is, again, it's part of the disease, not part of the solution. It's part of the problem, not part of the cure. The disease, the symptom is not the enemy. It's our friend. That's what our dreams are trying to, the crazy dreams that we have are doing their best to communicate us. And they're, they're disguising the messages because our conscious mind would reject it just like it does when we're awake. So it creates these scenarios to help us work through what we're not facing during the day. More from James Hollis. There'll be a few quotes here. I found myself drawing upon him as I got ready for this. Speaking of the second life of second half of life, he said, but such is the first adulthood, full of blunders, shyness, inhibitions, mistaken assumptions, and always the silent rolling of tapes of childhood. If one had not set forth and made those mistakes and crashed into those walls, then one would have remained a child. Reviewing one's life from the vantage point of the second half of life requires understanding and forgiveness of the inevitable crime of unconsciousness. The problem for me with goal setting and resolutions, the problem for me, this is just for me, is that it is too dependent upon the conscious mind. The things that I think I want on the surface superficially aren't the things that are going to bring me oftentimes the greatest meaning and the greatest joy. They are external to me. And they might have a temporary fix, if you will, making reference to the idea of the drug. They might have a temporary fix for me but they don't really feed the soul in the way that my soul is asking for. And Carl Jung said, we cannot live the afternoon of life according to the program of life's morning. For what was great in the morning will be a little at evening, and what in the morning was true will at evening will have become a lie. That's how contrary I experience the idea of goal setting and resolutions is that I'm not even going to feel the same about things later on. Furthermore, James Hollis said, life is not a disease and a neurosis is not a cancer to be excised. Any seeming resolution today will have to be revised tomorrow for the psyche is a flowing river. And yesterday's resolution, yesterday's resolution is tomorrow's constriction. We have to wipe it clean over and over again. Start again, start anew, one day at a time. Face what's coming. And that doesn't mean that we don't have to pay our bills and we don't have to Go to the doctor and to the dentist. I'm not talking about those kinds of things. Those are things that I write in my phone every day. I have to keep a schedule. I have a goal set to, to finish my, my, my tax preparation with my accountant. All of that is very practical. I'm not describing that. I'm describing this, this spiritual journey. 
And so much of our procrastination, <laughs> I remember I was doing an intensive with an individual years ago and, and he didn't really know what he wanted his, his current day piece of work to be about. So he said, I think I want it to be about procrastination. I said, well, it could be about procrastination. We'll see. And we set up some scenario with different people in his life, specifically some members of his family of origin, parents. And as I started to go through the, the psychodrama with him, the role plays with him, it was very clear to me that the reason that he was procrastinating is because he didn't feel like the world was going to be very welcoming of what he had to offer. That he was uh, afraid of failure, afraid of rejection, afraid of coming up short. So again, it wasn't about procrastination. It was about family of origin trauma, specifically in this case, his mother. Could have been his father just as well, but in this case, it happened to be his mother. And, and this, this overarching theme of criticism for anything that he did. Years ago, I was in a professional workshop when I was a young professional. This is 25 years ago or so. Made a little bit over than that, actually. 28 years ago. I was in a professional workshop. I was really happy to be there. I was the youngest person in this group. My career was just beginning. It was starting off really well. And so I was invited to be a part of this executive workshop team. And the presenter talked about mission statements and goals. And he asked us all to complete a simple mission statement. He described what it was. He asked that this particular one be in one sentence. So I thought about it and thought about it. I thought, what would be true? What, what could I write down that would be true? What do I hope for that would be true in all circumstances, hopefully throughout all time? And I came up with, after some significant thought, the phrase to be. My hope is to be. To be who I am, just to be. Not to do anything. And when it was my turn to read, I was nervous and I read it and I got criticized. I was told that I wasn't taking the exercise seriously. Because again, I didn't fit into this, this Western kind of idea that you line up the pins and you knock them over and then your life will be a satisfying, successful life. I was looking, of course, at a much more spiritual journey for myself. So here are some goals and resolutions that I have found worthy in my life to state, to write down, to, to, to strive for. Number one, to become who I am. That is a mantra I repeat to myself every day. Can I be who I am? Can I tell the truth about what I feel, what I think, what I want, and what I don't want in important situations and important relationships? One day at a time. It's so easy when we set goals to think of the big picture. Sometimes people will tell you one of the re important aspects of goal setting is that you can break down a big goal into smarter, smaller parts. And again, that can be very effective for some people. But for me, because of my anxiety, I have to focus on one day at a time because I can get overwhelmed when I try to, to swallow the big pill all at once. I wrote down, don't diet. That is something I pra I've always struggled with body image. I've always struggled with weight fluctuating. I've, I've, uh, on the one hand, I've run marathons and Ironman triathlons. I've been in fantastic shape. The pandemic was a horrible time for me and my body. Um, but coming out of the pandemic, I, I wanted to try something different again. I wanted to try something that I could sustain a way of living, a way of life. And one of the goals that I set for myself is not to diet. In fact, not to try to lose weight, but just to try to to live in harmony with my life. If I found myself eating junk food, instead of focusing on not eating junk food, I go back to what am I doing during the day in my life? How am I scheduling myself? How am I responding to requests for my time in ways that cause me to want to medicate with junk food? So I thought that one was one I would share with you. Take responsibility for my happiness, my serenity, my peace, my meaning with my wife. Somebody asked me recently, are you judgmental? And my response was, you know, when I get angry, when I get hurt, I can definitely project that, that anger and hurt in, in the form of criticism onto other people. But I can also deconstruct that and realize that I'm just hurt, that I'm just sad. I can take responsibility for my happiness. I can realize that it's not up to my wife to make me happy. That is my job. 
And more importantly for me specifically as a codependent, it is not my job to make my wife or my children happy. That is their job. Go to therapy even when I don't need it. That is something that I do. I go to therapy even when I don't need it. Maybe more particularly, especially when I don't think I need it. I was just telling my, my the three therapists that I spend a lot of time with, my wife and my, my two adult children, just the other day, I was describing how many sessions I have had where somebody starts off with saying, I don't really have anything to talk about. In 30 minutes in, we're talking about some significant developmental trauma. Therapy is often what happens when we let our guard down, when we don't think there's a specific problem or issue. Just the other day, just the other day, we were talking about um, step parenting. Somebody was asking, fair enough, asking for a book on step parenting, which I didn't have as a resource. What I did say was there's something more fun fundamental about this journey than being a step parent or being a spouse or being a parent for that matter. I even joked when I first released the journey of the heroic parent, I was at a speaking engagement in New York and somebody said to me, came to the desk to get a signature in the book. And they said to me, so give me the, 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 the essential thesis of, of your book uh, of parenting. They said, and I said, the book really isn't about parenting, which they looked at me, of course, very, very strangely. And I said, of course, that's the context, but we could be talking about anything. And I would be talking about and teaching the same things. It's about life. Developing more self-compassion. That is, again, self-compassion leads to awareness because awareness is the ability to see yourself as you are. And if you are judgmental toward yourself, you won't see the faults and the flaws. Just the other day, I made some comment in a group about somebody that I love being a mess. And somebody came back to me, walked up to me after the speaking engagement and said, how could you say that? That doesn't even sound like a therapist. I said, oh, I don't have the associations of shame with the idea of being a mess. I'm a mess. My life has been a mess many, many times. And so I forget that when I call myself a narcissist in recovery, a codependent person, when I call myself a mess, when I talk about myself being an idiot, I forget that people are running that through the filter that they have of judgment. My goal is more self-compassion because the more self-compassion will lead to almost everything that I want in this life. Learn to fail better. Learn to get good at, at losing and failing. That's one of the other keys of enlightenment in my book. Learn to abandon old ideas, old contexts, old relationships that don't serve me. Learn to say no. Learn to quit. Learn to give up. Learn to lose better. For me as a codependent, I have to learn to drop balls. The reason I want that junk food at night is because I have enough shame that I don't want to drop balls. I want to say yes to everybody. I want to be there for everybody. I want to be the good dad, the good husband, the good therapist, the good employer, the good coworker, the good citizen, the good neighbor. And all of that pressure and saying yes to all of those obligations leaves me starving. And I take the processed food and sugar to fill that hole. To embrace not knowing. To learn to not be so certain, right? To not fall into that trap I spoke about at the early part of this broadcast to, to replace the, 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 the ambiguity that is life, the uncertainty that is life with certainty. To embrace not knowing. To embrace my own dilemma, my own mental illness. I want to know it. I want to know what it is. I want to know what are my go-to symptoms? What are my go-to patterns? What do I do that, that's it's unconscious and reactive? And, and knowing that, not fixing that. Notice I didn't say fixing my dilemma. Knowing my dilemma will fix it. But if I try to fix it, if I try to fix the symptom, it'll just prop up somewhere else in the garden because the symptom is not the issue. The symptom is just a signal trying to invite me to a deeper more spiritual relationship with myself, with the world. Practice ego death is a goal that I have. Ego death is just recognizing how I want to look to the world, that I want to be attractive, compelling, interesting, important, worthy of admiration, worthy of really of love, worthy of connection. I want my house to be the biggest. I want my car to be the best, right? That's my conditioning as a, as a male. That's my worth. 
the zeros in my bank account tell people how special I am. And what I've been practicing these, these past few years is letting that go. I remember just recently I was downsizing to this house, which I absolutely love. And I was telling my therapist, I have a hard time letting go of this. And she said, as simply and gently as she could, she said, oh, you're still struggling with that, are you? And I remember thinking, I can let it go. It's not who I am. And this has been my, my favorite house that I've had in many ways because of that. I wrote down here, schedule guitar lessons each week. I wrote that down because, again, I want to, I've said my whole, I used to playfully say to my students, my clients in the wilderness, I would say, I would do everything, excuse me, I would do anything. I would do anything to play guitar except for exercise and take lessons. I would do anything to speak Spanish except for study, practice, and take lessons. I would do anything to be in shape except for exercise and eat right, I would tell them. And then they would laugh and we would talk about it. So I take guitar lessons. I do something I am not good at. Which again, I wish I had learned as a child. That's one of the keys to life. Do things that you're not good at. Learn to fail. I remember I was talking to a NFL, NFL uh, executive one day. And he saw the, this quote of mine that said, learn to fail. And he looked at me and he said, I, I can't relate to that. My whole life has been about winning. And I said, well, I actually believe that you do believe in this. So, so I gave him an example. I said, if when you were coaching somebody on the team, made a mistake, fell down, threw an interception, dropped a ball, and they came over to the sidelines with their head hanging low, what would you say to them? He said, I would tell them to forget about it. I would tell them to be like a goldfish, he said to me, to have a short memory. And I said, see, you're teaching people how to lose. Facing fear, I have to recommit to that every day, and I fail at it all the time. I run away from it all the time. It gets the best of me. Focus on causes, not outcomes. I love the quote that I shared the other day on social media. I think I shared it the other day on the broadcast. The person, it's not my quote, the person nearing enlightenment, the bodhisattva, the person nearing enlightenment tries to avoid the causes. An ordinary person tries to avoid, avoid the results, the outcomes, the symptoms. So don't try to stop be acting to your partner, find the source, go back to the root. Don't cut off the plant, the weed at the surface. You know what will happen if that happens. Focus on causes, not outcomes. Focus on the relationship with my child, not their behaviors. I have, to, I had to talk myself into that today. In fact, I was thinking about this the other day, you know, 20 years ago, I would have said the opposite. I'm glad I didn't set goals around this to keep this idea in my head my entire life. Before I would have said, I would have said, what's more important is kind of shaping the person's behavior. Who cares if the relationship, I've had parents, many, a hundred more or more parents tell me, I'm willing to lose the relationship if my child will, will, will do this thing. And I know what they mean. I know what I meant. I meant willing to sacrifice, willing to lose the temporary, willing to the, the, the temporary warmth of relationship or willing to go through the conflict, lose the battle, if you will, be the bad guy, that kind of thing. I understand that that's a part of that equation. But what I know now is that the relationship is the, is the, is the silver bullet. The attachment is by far the most important in the hierarchy of psychological dynamics for the child. The attachment, the ability to be seen, heard, to have the inner child, inner the, the child's inner world known and respected by the, the the adult parent, that's the key. And of course, that's based on the healthy relationship the parent has with themselves. So they've got to do their work. They've got to unravel their past, their childhood. Be willing to abandon any goal I have set for myself as an act of self care, or for my own evolution. Again, I'm sharing these because they're related to goals, but they're a, a, a different, an uncommon look at the topic of goals. Grapple with guilt and shame. Do battle with my dragons. I work on that every day. Tell, tell the truth about how I feel and what I need um, to those that I love. 
I am a codependent. So I will tell you, I have said, I have learned this about myself. I have been a lifelong liar. Not because uh, I had some, some devious motive, but because I was trying to protect a fragile ego. I was trying to be loved. I was trying to, 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 to be uh, the way that I thought would, would make people want to be around me and be connected to me. So I've told people what they want to hear. I didn't even know it. So I try to tell the truth. James Hollis said, to become a person does not necessarily mean to be well-adjusted, well-adapted, approved of by others. It means to become who you are. We are meant to become more eccentric, more peculiar, more odd. We are not meant to just fit in. We are here to be different. We are here to be the individual. To become a person does not necessarily... Excuse me, that's the same thing. So it's messy. Failures are as important, maybe even more important than the successes in terms of the lessons that we learn in life. And the becoming a person is messy. And to be the parent of, of a child, when we set it as our goal, our, our, our North Star, to help that child become who they are, ooh, it is hard, hard, time-intensive work, heart-intensive work. And I don't know how to think about things in terms of, of superficial goals and tasks but I do know how to think of things in terms of the spiritual journey. And that has changed and evolved for me. And, and my wife reminds me every once in a while, you might think differently about things for five, year, five years from now. I know this. Somebody have, somebody's told me this. If you listen to my broadcast today in 2024 and you compare it with my broadcast in 2007 when I began this journey, you would hear some similar things, but you would hear some, some subtle but profound differences in the way that I think about parenting and life and relationships and selfhood. So my take homes for the night is find what works for you. If goal setting works for you, more power to you. But if the culture of goal setting of, of ambition causes you like it does me more stress becomes part of the problem, not part of the solution. This broadcast is for you. Hopefully listen to these messengers, listen to the problems, the symptoms, the procrastination, the lack of follow through. It could be something as simple as that you're neurodiverse and you might need medication for it. It could be something more nuanced and spiritual, like the thing that you're searching for won't bring you happiness and is consistent with a, a long line of goals that you've set for yourself that haven't brought you happiness. Face or don't what is being asked of your soul. What is the thing that you're avoiding? about yourself? What is the task that you haven't taken on as your responsibility? And how might your symptoms, your anxiety, your depression be signaling the invitation, the call to address those issues? All right, folks, I hope that was helpful and not crazy for you. The Journey of the Heroic Parent and the Audacity to Be You are available on Audible and Amazon. If you want to attend an intensive work, this is an immersive process that will help you do what I've talked about tonight. The next availability is February 21st through 25th. January is full. We, we did have one spot just the other day for the online version, January 26th through 28th. The online version is about half the time and about a third of the cost. Obviously, you're staying at home. You can stay at home and do it from home. We also have a returning to you. I'll be running that March 6th through 10th. If you've been to Finding You and you want to come back for, for, for a reconnection, a refuel, a reset, returning to you is that option, March 6th through 10th. And then, of course, the Finding Connection Workshop where you can come as couples February 7th through 11th is that offering. We have custom offerings for families and for couples. Just contact intensives at evoketherapy.com or go to our web, web page. We have support groups for current and alumni families of our wilderness program. The next one is in 15 minutes this evening at 7 p.m., January 11th, and next week, January 18th at 7 p.m. Once a month. We have an alumni only meeting. That's for people that are a little bit farther along on their journey. January 15th at 6 p.m. Mountain Time is the next alumni only meeting. And then, of course, we have a, a broadcast, or excuse me, a support group available for our intensives and our coaching clients. February 13th, once a month, February 13th, 7 p.m. Mountain Time is that next offering. If you have more questions, you can go to our website or email us at supportgroups at evoketherapy.com to find out more to register. If you want to work with a, a, an Evoke coach or therapist, 
virtually in a, in a coaching context, parents, couples, families, individuals, virtually anything you can imagine that, 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 that is surrounding this discussion that I had today. We have so many coaches, 45 coaches with, with various backgrounds and experiences, um, who have all been introduced to this basic, this, this foundational idea of attachment based work that I talk about in these broadcasts. Contact coaching at evoketherapy.com for more. We ask all current parents to attend to just try six of any of the following 12 step support groups alanon.org, coda.org, familiesanonymous.org, adultchildren.org, re refugerecovery.org is a Buddhist inspired recovery program, less of an emphasis on a higher power. And of course, the National Alliance on Mental Illness, NAMI.org, has free classes and resources in your local community. All these broadcasts are available on your favorite podcast app or Spotify. Just search Finding You and Evoke Therapy Podcast. Subscribe there. You'll be notified when the new episodes drop, which is usually about, about a day after their broadcast live. You can also go to, to soundcloud.com and listen on your computer, or you can go to Evoke's YouTube channel and watch the video rebroadcasts of all of these. You can find Evoke Therapy programs and me, Dr. Brad Reedy, on X, threads, and Instagram using the handles at Evoke Therapy and at Dr. Brad Reedy, respectively. You can find Evoke Intensives on Instagram using the handle at Evoke Therapy Intensives. And on Facebook, you can find us by searching either Evoke Therapy Programs or Evoke Therapy Intensives. And be sure to check out our blog for wonderful content written from a very personal firsthand pr perspective by our, our Evoke Therapy staff. One of the things I'm most proud of in my career, my, my company, is that I have had as much positive feedback from how this work changes the employees, their personal lives as I have from the clients. All right, folks, my next broadcast will be next week, January 16th. That'll be an open forum. Any family, any, any siblings of our program can attend. You can always submit questions in advance to webinar at evoketherapy.com. You can ask for copies of slides from the topic presentations like tonight. You can make topic suggestions or simply ask a question that will be answered during the next live Q and A. So I'll see you January 16th at 6 PM mountain time to, to do that. As always, thank you for showing up. I hope this is a help, helpful point of contact. And for on behalf of the people that you love and the people that love you, thanks for doing your work. Thanks for looking, taking the heroic journey to look at yourself in this process. It makes all the difference in the world. Have a great evening, and I'll talk to you next week. Bye-bye.